Hey listeners, I'm Hallie. And I'm Brittany. And thank you for tuning back into the Abyss this week. Don't forget to subscribe and like our Facebook page, follow us on Instagram, hit up all of that social media. It's the way that we're going to reach out to you and let you know about new episodes, the way we're going to talk about updates on cases, and give us a five-star rating and a review. We really love to hear feedback from you guys. You're our supporters, and we take what you tell us very seriously, so make sure to go and do that. Also, we really recommend going to our website, theabysspod.com, and checking out the episode links on there. We put a lot of pictures, a lot of resources, videos if we can, books if there are good ones that relate to the case. So please go check out our website. We really want to keep you updated like that. And I know for me, when I see things visually, they help a lot. So go and do that. Also, don't forget to stay tuned for bloopers at the end of every episode. That kind of lightened the mood a little bit after the heavy and dense topics we talk about. Rochester, New York was a quiet, close-knit community until the brutal murder of a young girl destroyed the idealism of its residents. Within three years, three bodies of little girls were found. The victims were all around the same age and each had hardships at home and in school, but the most chilling similarity was that each girl had matching first and last initials. Was there a killer in search of victims with double initials, or was it just a remarkable coincidence? This is the case of the alphabet murders. So let's jump into the abyss. Carmen Colon was born in 1961 in Puerto Rico. Her mother was young and only 16 years old and struggled to provide Carmen with the life she knew she deserved. She was raised primarily by her grandparents and had to overcome many challenges at a really young age. Carmen spent the first eight years of her life growing up in Puerto Rico before she eventually moved to upstate New York. She found English to be a very difficult language to learn, and she ended up falling behind in her lessons. This forced her to take remedial classes, and it proved to be a challenge. Carmen also suffered from night terrors, which WebMD states as being, quote, episodes of intense screaming, crying, thrashing, or fear during sleep that happen again and again. On November 16, 1971, 10-year-old Carmen Colon went to the local pharmacy later in the afternoon to pick up a prescription for her family. The pharmacist informed her that the prescription wasn't ready yet, which we've all been there, and she ran out of the store saying she had to go. The pharmacist noticed that Carmen seemed to be in a little bit of a hurry. It was reported that Carmen was seen getting into a car, and she didn't seem uncomfortable in the situation. She wasn't reluctant to get in. She didn't seem to be forced to enter the vehicle. She just jumped in it and left. The next time Carmen Cologne was seen would be something straight out of our deepest nightmares. Carmen was seen running down the highway I-140 West near the Chili Riga exit. She was running from a car, naked from the waist down, and was waving her arms as if asking for help from anyone who was passing. The man who was driving the car that she jumped out of then reversed the vehicle and dragged her back into the car. This occurred during rush hour and about 38 witnesses saw her, probably more that just didn't get reported. However, the incident wasn't officially reported to law enforcement until three days later. Remember that this is a 10-year-old girl who was half naked, running down the highway, waving her arms for help. If that doesn't scream danger in an unusual situation, then I don't know what does. But it seems weird that nobody decided to call the police right then or even report it shortly after. Yeah, it's pretty crazy that many people could see a scene like that and not be immediately prompted to call the police or tell someone and the fact that they waited so long to say anything is just insane to me because that's such a like that's such an like you said unusual thing to see and yeah that should really like set off an alarm in people's heads and especially a child and if someone had acted then she could still be alive like it's as simple as that if someone had just done what they should have done right in that moment all of this could have been avoided. And it reminds me, I know a lot of people that are familiar with true crime know the Kitty Genovese case. And I just read a book about her case. And it was sort of a similar thing where a lot of people saw 
that crime take place or at least parts of it, but most of the people didn't even try to help and just sort of didn't want to get involved. And it's just so dangerous to be in that state of mind. Like we all need to help each other and speak up when we see something like that. Don't fall into the bystander effect. (laughs) On November 18th, two days after this sighting of Carmen on the highway, two teenagers were walking and saw a mannequin laying on the side of the road and decided to investigate. Unfortunately, the saying that we all know is true, and it was not a mannequin. It was the body of Carmen Colon. She was naked from the waist down, just as she had been seen on the highway. She had scratches and bruises all over her, and her pants were found later on a nearby service road. There was evidence of sexual assault, and the cause of death was determined to be strangulation. The police started an investigation into the homicide and directed it towards Miguel Colon, Carmen's uncle. They interviewed Miguel about his relationship with Carmen, as well as her disappearance and death. Shortly after this interview, he traveled back to Puerto Rico, and he got into a little bit of controversy with his family. Miguel was involved in a domestic dispute and proceeded to shoot his wife and brother-in-law. Thankfully, both individuals were okay, though. Miguel must have felt some kind of guilt or would rather have done anything except go to jail because he then committed suicide by shooting himself. Due to the lack of evidence and the death of Miguel Colon, he was never indicted with Carmen's murder. Apart from Miguel Colon, the police also looked at a man named James Barber. He was a known sex offender in the Rochester area, but the lead went cold really quickly and they weren't able to extend on it any further. A year and a half later, tragedy struck the area again. Wanda Wachowicz was an 11-year-old girl. Her family was troubled after the sudden death of her father after a long battle with addiction and mental illness, and Wanda was forced to step up and help care for her younger siblings. She had to take on responsibilities that were way beyond her years just to help her family out. On the evening of April 2nd, 1973, Wanda went to a local grocery store. It was her turn to pick up food for the family. When she was done shopping, she left the store and saw three friends outside heading the same direction she was going. She sort of walked with them for a while, but lagged behind a bit, and the other children didn't stop to wait for her because it was raining and they were trying to hurry home. They turned back every so often to see if Wanda was still there, and at one point they saw her leaning against a fence, resting with the heavy bag she was carrying, but all seemed normal, so they just headed on their way. A little while later, they saw a large brown car traveling down the road towards them. When they turned back to check on Wanda again, both she and the car were nowhere to be seen. Several hours passed, and Wanda's mother became concerned about where her daughter was. She should have long been back by now. And by 8 p.m., her mother started to really panic. And it was at this point she decided to call the police and report Wanda as missing. The night went by with no leads or information about where Wanda could be. Answers didn't come until the next morning when an officer patrolling in Webster, New York, noticed something on the side of the road. When he went to examine it more closely, he realized it was the body of a young girl. Nearly 14 hours after she was reported missing, Wanda's body was found. Wanda was found fully clothed, but an autopsy revealed that she had been sexually assaulted and that her cause of death was strangulation. The contents of her stomach showed that she had ingested custard shortly before her death, and it was assumed that this had been provided by the killer because she hadn't received custard from school or home, and she hadn't bought it at the store either, so that kind of ruled out the other places she might have gotten that. Semen was found on Wanda's undergarments, but at that point, technology just wasn't at a place where that evidence could be used to connect her murder to an individual, but it was more evidence that she had been sexually assaulted, and they saved that evidence for later when technology would become advanced enough to obtain more information from that. A lot of tips poured in about what had happened to Wanda. One witness claimed to have seen Wanda being taken in a light-colored Dodge Dart. Another tip came from two girls that told police that a man had tried to lure them into his Ford a couple of days prior to Wanda's disappearance. Someone else told police that they had seen her body being dumped, and yet another tip came in that a witness saw Wanda crying in a green pinto accompanied by a tattooed man. 
Even with all these tips, police were getting nowhere. Every tip seemed to just take them right back to square one. And nothing was coming from this information, even though it seemed like a lot of leads that they could pursue. Police tried to work the case from every angle. They checked up on every sex offender in the area. They looked into an elderly man that was known in the area for sexually assaulting young girls by, quote unquote, coercing kisses out of the neighborhood girls. And they also considered a local convict with a history of violence against women. Each sex offender they looked into led to a dead end, and no leads or arrest came from any of their efforts for a very long time. At one point, the public received a ray of hope when police announced that they were about to make an arrest when they started questioning a man with a history of child endangerment. Police felt strongly that he was connected to the murders, but after he passed a polygraph test, he was let go and hoped that the murderer would be off the streets was dashed once again. The similarities between Carmen and Wanda's killings were undeniable, and many feared that meant a serial killer was preying on children in the area. The two girls were of similar ages, both had hardships at home, both were from Catholic families, and were disenfranchised from their peers, and another striking similarity were their names. Each girl had double initials, CC for Carmen Cologne and WW for Wanda Walkowitz. Even more eerie than that, each girl was found in a town with the same initial. Carmen was found in Churchville, New York, while Wanda was found in Webster, New York. This seemed like too much of a coincidence for the people of Rochester, and it really seemed someone was stalking their children and had a very specific pattern to what they wanted. Another odd piece of the story is that after Wanda was laid to rest, her family would visit her grave only to find someone had already been there. The grave was always cleared off and flowers were left and this went on for years. The family never found out if it was just a kind-hearted Samaritan or if someone was full of guilt for what they had done. Even though police had reached a dead end at this point, the community really hoped that this was the end of the killings and no more children would be harmed. Unfortunately, this was not true. Michelle Mainza was a 10-year-old girl who struggled to fit in at school just like Carmen and Wanda. She spent a lot of her time with younger kids because her peers were not the friendliest. Regardless of Michelle's kindness and selflessness, her peers would tease her and bully her about her weight. And this really was a lot on her shoulders. On November 26th, 1973, Michelle went to a shopping plaza in search for her mother's purse. Her mother had gone by there earlier that day and forgot or lost her purse. Michelle was kind enough to retrace her steps to the plaza, and once she was there, her uncle saw her and offered to give her a ride back home, but she denied because she still needed to find her mother's purse. After this, Michelle disappeared. She never returned home and worry started to grow. Two days later, Michelle was found in Macedon, New York by a man named Jean Van de Wald. If you were paying attention whenever Brittany mentioned the similarities between the Carmen and Wanda case, the place they were found also started with the same letter as their name. And it's the same thing here. Michelle Mainza was found in Macedon, New York. Michelle was found fully clothed but had evidence of sexual assault, just like the other girls. And during the autopsy, it was determined that the cause of death was strangulation, and she had a cheeseburger in her stomach, proving that she ate shortly before her death. Wanda also had food in her stomach, so there seemed to be another connection there. Law enforcement started to receive tips about Michelle's disappearance, and it's chilling to hear how close she could have been to being saved. One tip was from Michelle's friend, who said that they saw her in a beige car, with an older man who was driving crazily on the road and almost caused an accident. This was confirmed by other people who saw the chaotic driving and the near collision. Another person told police that they saw a man with a young girl in a fast food restaurant. The man was noted to have dirty hands and a description of the individual was provided for a sketch. The man bought the young girl a cheeseburger and they then left. If you remember, the autopsy showed a cheeseburger in Michelle Mainza's stomach. After releasing the composite sketch of the man, the police opened up a hotline for people to call with any information that they had that was possibly related to the alphabet murders. Many calls came in, but none of them were successful. However, there was one that really stood out. A man came forward and provided some astounding information. He stated that he had attempted to help a man in a beige car on Route 350 near Macedon, who had a broken down vehicle. He had noticed that the man was trying to conceal his license plate as well as the person who was in the car, which resembled Michelle Maines a little bit. Obviously, if he was trying to conceal the girl, though, he probably didn't get a very clear shot of who she was. But after a few exchanges, the man threatened to punch this good Samaritan and 
caused the helper to leave, but not before getting a partial license plate. A few days later, the man came across the same beige car and got the entire license plate number and reported it to the police. The police started looking into this individual and discovered that the person was an unemployed man living with his family in Lyon, New York. Ironically, he matched the description of the man seen with the young girl at the fast food restaurant and the description of the beige car. The man, who is unnamed, claimed he had nothing to do with the murders and even provided an alibi that he was out job hunting all that day. The alibi was checked out by his phone records and his family supported his statement. However, it was noted by some people online that a family member could have easily used his phone to help create this alibi and then lied for him. We've seen some stranger things happen in the true crime world and it wouldn't be unheard of. The police must have thought the same thing and needed a little bit more security in his innocence and they had the man take a polygraph test. The man passed and he was released afterwards. The similarities in these three murders were really striking. The initials really stuck in people's minds and they thought, how could something like that be a coincidence? In addition to that, as we kind of discussed a little bit before, all the girls were close in age. They all came from Catholic families. They all lived in poor neighborhoods. They were all having trouble fitting in with their peers. All of them were running normal errands for their families. And each body was found in a rural area. Each victim was sexually assaulted and strangled. And white cat hair was also found on each of the three girls, suggesting that The killer may have used a cat as a way to draw them in or make them more comfortable. Despite these similarities, authorities really couldn't piece together the rest of the crimes, though. Almost 30 years after the murders, a group of profilers came together to try and shed some new light on these gruesome murders. Roy Hazelwood and several other profilers, all retired from law enforcement, came together to review the facts of the case and to see if anything new could come of it. They compiled all the findings about the killings without hearing any of the opinions of the people who had previously worked it because they didn't want their opinions to be muddied or influenced. They really wanted fresh eyes on this old information in an unbiased way. They analyzed the abduction and disposal sites to see the similarities and differences between the three. They thought the killer was more concerned with distancing himself from his victims than he was about the bodies being found, which is why he would dispose of their bodies quickly, basically just tossing them away like trash when he was done with them, just to get them away from him and not necessarily to conceal it or in hopes that they would never be found or anything like that. All of the abduction sites were similar. The initial aspect was similar. And all of the girls being around the same age led many to believe that the three girls were killed by the same person. The profilers came to a different conclusion, though. Although there were a lot of similarities, there were also many differences. These mainly came up between Carmen's murder versus Wanda's and Michelle's. Carmen was found unclothed. She was strangled by hand rather than a ligature. And she was also more brutally assaulted than the other two. Wanda and Michelle, on the other hand, were both found clothed. Both were fed before being killed, and both were strangled with a belt or a rope rather than by hand. These things led the profilers to conclude that Carmen was killed by one person, and Michelle and Wanda were killed by another. They believed that the person that killed Carmen knew her, was between the ages of 25 and 30, had low intelligence, and likely abused alcohol. They also thought that the killer had a short temper, and they stated that they believed that Carmen's murder was motivated by anger, and was a more impulsive act. Conversely, their profile for Wanda and Michelle's killer included that the perpetrator was likely of average intelligence, that he had probably been arrested previously for more minor sexual offenses, and they think that he lured and placated the girls with treats and possibly a pet like the white cat. They said they felt that the killer had some level of respect for his victims, as twisted as that sounds, But he either redressed them or let them redress themselves before killing them and dumping their bodies. And this showed that maybe he wanted them to retain some semblance of dignity. While they asserted that Carmen's murder was an impulsive thing fueled by anger, they said that the other two killings were more quote unquote functional. He basically needed to kill them to avoid being identified or having to deal with them. It was more out of necessity than any anger or passion. The team of profilers also told authorities that they thought that 
The victims were chosen based on gender, age, availability, and vulnerability rather than their initials. In fact, they believed that the initials played no part in the selection of the victims. We're going to get into specific suspects considered in a minute, but I just wanted to say here that I find the initial thing to be such a huge coincidence. I think there's a lot of scenarios that it could actually fit into. So I wouldn't necessarily discount it completely. It could have been someone involved in a school or a church or somewhere in the community like that that would have known the girls' names. It could have been someone that was sort of tangentially involved in the lives of these children. When we were discussing this case, we kind of talked about how some serial killers can sort of change or evolve their M.O., So I don't think that the differences between Carmen and the other two girls definitively means that there was more than one killer. We know Carmen tried to escape and that could have caused him to lash out or feel more rushed. Maybe he just hadn't developed his standard MO yet at that point. And that could have been why she was more viciously attacked and why he used his hands rather than a belt or a rope. He could have been refining his process of killing over the couple years between Carmen and Wanda's killings. So it definitely could have been two killers, but I don't think that it's been proven for me that it definitely was. I could see it sort of going either way. I agree. And they even say that maybe after Michelle that the killings just stopped. But who's to say that he was still refining his MO and now it's just a little different. He may have even moved, may not be matching their initials anymore, maybe changing his targets a little bit, and he could still be out there killing. I think of all the cases that we've researched and talked about, both for the podcast and just general interest, we've seen that before where a serial killer will totally change up their MO. Cough, cough, Israel keys. Yeah. And there's just almost no way to link that stuff, especially in the 70s and before that. Cough, cough, Richard Kuklinski. <laughs> I, I don't think that they can definitively say whether it was one or two at this point. I can really see the evidence sort of fitting into each category. I also thought about how the two latter murders could have been sparked by the first one. Maybe the initial thing was a coincidence for Carmen, but it struck a chord or an interest or even an obsession with someone else, and that caused them to carry out the latter two murders. There's so many ways that this could go, but if the names genuinely had nothing to do with it, I'd be very surprised. That just seems like such a crazy coincidence. Like we said, stranger things have happened, but that's one heck of a coincidence in my head, and... I can't really set it aside with the evidence that we've seen so far. I can even kind of see why police and profilers wouldn't want that piece to be significant, honestly, because it sort of blows a hole in their otherwise sort of neat explanation of the case. If the names were a factor, then it had to either be someone that had general access to the girls or was skilled at stalking them, and that could open up dimensions of the case that make it a lot more complicated. Well, if you consider how kids are so protected from publicity and their records being released all because they're underage it would really have to be someone who has access which is extremely limited yeah and since they didn't really go to the same school or church or have any crossover like that it's hard to see where someone would have access to each of them but I feel like there's a lot of people in our lives that we sort of take for granted that we see a lot so It really could be anybody, especially in that time in sort of a small community where people trust each other more and are more open with each other. But it's just really frustrating to have so much, but also so little on these cases. As I said before, semen had been found in Wanda's underwear, but at the time technology just wasn't advanced enough to develop a profile based on that DNA. But about 30 years after the murder, technology finally caught up and a technique called short tandem repeat analysis was used to extract the DNA. This allowed for DNA to be found even on very old samples. DNA is a really hardy molecule and it holds up really well over time. It's just a question of technology being advanced enough to extract it and use it. And thankfully, huge strides are being made in this field and more and more we are hearing about Super old cases being cracked, and I can't wait to see that being used more. Now diving some into the suspects of the alphabet murders, in 1977, Dennis Termini 
was investigated as one of the first suspects for the alphabet murders. He was 25 years old and worked as a firefighter in Rochester, New York. Termini had a beige-colored car, which matched the description provided by witnesses. He also had a uniform in the back of his car, which could have been a way to appear more trusting and welcoming. He also lived a half mile from the school that Michelle Mainza attended, so he seemed to be pretty close in relations to her. As well as having a map in his car of the area where Michelle's body was dumped. This is really peculiar because out of all places in New York, why would you have a map of Macedon? Something even more significant was that he supposedly had the same cat fur in his car that was found on the bodies. This has not been accurately compared through DNA since in the time DNA science wasn't really a big thing back then. So it's not 100% proven true, but it appeared to be similar. For all we know, this could have been from a different cat, though it's not 100%. In 1977, Termini committed suicide in front of police officers after being caught sexually assaulting a young teenager. He was referred to as the garage rapist, and it was discovered that he mainly targeted 18 to 21 year olds. This made it really hard to link him to the rape and murder of the children since they were at the ages 10 and 11. Police would later exhume Termini's body for a sample of his DNA to see if it matched what was found with Wanda, but it did not, and in 2007, he was officially cleared of the alphabet murders. Another interesting lead that law enforcement pursued was about a man named Kenneth Bianchi. This name probably sounds familiar to some true crime followers because this is one of the members of the Hillside Strangler duo, which in itself is another episode entirely considering they murdered many women. But interestingly, Kenneth lived in Rochester, New York at the time of the Alphabet murders. He had worked as an ice cream truck driver, ambulance driver, and a security guard. So all of these were really trusting positions, and he could easily create a pathway for gaining a child's trust, and even the trust of most adults. However, Kenneth was often accused of theft from his employers, which made him a really unreliable worker. To connect him to the alphabet murders, it was noted that the forensic evidence found at the crime scene of Wanda Walkowitz was very unique, and in fact, it could only be linked to about 20% of the male population, which Kenneth just so happened to be included in. However, when the DNA was compared, it did not match Kenneth Bianchi. Wanda also, if, if you remember, Wanda also had custard in her stomach, which is interesting considered he worked as an ice cream truck driver for a while. And like we talked about before, if the names did play a role in picking the victims and it was someone that was ingratiating himself into the lives of these kids, an ice cream truck driver would be a prime candidate because they go into lots of different neighborhoods and they would talk to lots of different kids and maybe see them regularly. So that's really creepy. Yeah, have repeating customers as the children and constantly asking them, oh, did you go to church? Where did you go? oh, what's your first and last name? But in a not creepy way, obviously. (laughs) And yeah, because I mean, I mean, I know when I was a kid, I would go to the ice cream truck without parents and stuff. And I'm sure in the 70s and a smallish city, parents would have no problem with that. So it's not like he would have to navigate parents or anything like that, most likely. We're going to talk about this in another episode revolving Richard Kuklinski but he knew a man who was a hitman just like him. This guy was crazy, and he also disguised himself as an ice cream truck driver. So it's just insane yeah, how many things are popping up lately revolving killers and ice cream truck drivers. So next time I hear that song coming, I'm a hide. <laughs> yeah. yeah, moral of the story, never let your kid go to the ice cream truck. <laughs> Those SpongeBob SquarePants <laughs> ice cream popsicles are not worth it. So steering back on track to Bianchi, Michelle Mainza's crime scene also had a wrist slash palm print that they found, and it was compared to Kenneth Bianchi's wrist slash palm 10 years after the incident. Bianchi's print did not match the one found, but this doesn't really completely take him out of the equation because wrist prints can change over time, the way they bend and the curves of the hand, so it's not necessarily as strong as a fingerprint, so it doesn't take him out of the situation completely. Kenneth Bianchi 
denies murdering the young girls, but as we've seen from other cases, this doesn't really mean he is innocent. The case with Kenneth Bianchi kind of stops here, but they still keep a close eye and keep him considered as one of the suspects. Finally, after investigating multiple people for the alphabet murders, they found the alphabet killer. But was it really the one they were looking for? Was it the person responsible for the deaths of Carmen, Wanda, and Michelle? In 2010, police in California were searching the home of a man named Joseph Nasso. He was on probation for a crime committed in California, and probation officers were at Nasso's home carrying out a routine search. While in the home, probation officers found photographs that seemed to depict women that were unconscious or dead, and Nasso said that they were simply works of art. But the officers were sufficiently disturbed enough to conduct a full search of Nasso's home. They found guns, handcuffs, a law enforcement uniform, and a video about notorious serial killers like Ted Bundy. They also found mannequin parts. They found a mannequin wearing a red dress. And they found about $150,000 in cash. The most chilling pieces of evidence found were handwritten pages, including one that referred to at least seven women with locations to where several bodies could be found. Four of these women were found. And in 2011, NASA was charged with the murders of Roxine Rogash, Pamela Parsons, Tracy Tafoya, and another woman named Carmen Cologne that has no relation to the victim in Rochester. And hearing about this list of locations for women he had killed, it's giving me major Robert Hansen flashbacks. And if you don't know about him, we have an episode on Robert Hansen. He was our case number four, I think. And it's a two-part episode, and it's insane. He has a whole aviation map that he marked off locations, and this is what it's kind of making me think of. Yeah, for sure. Very similar to that, which is just so creepy just to find handwritten notes that relate to that. I don't know. That just is chilling. Roxine and Carmen were killed in 1977 and 1978, and Pamela and Tracy were killed in 1993 and 1994, respectively. The notes found in Joseph... Nasso's home included detailed accounts of the sexual assaults he perpetrated. He also had little notes referring to the victims. In an entry about Tracy Tafoya, he said, quote, met Tracy, put it to her, end quote. According to his writing, he committed over a hundred rapes. But according to Nasso himself, these entries didn't really mean he was an actual rapist. In court, he said, quote, I sometimes use the term rape to mean I scored. I made out. When I use the word rape, it just means I had a good time, end quote. His DNA was found on Roxine's pantyhose, which was pretty damning evidence. But Nasso still pled not guilty. He even decided to represent himself in court, which just, let me tell you, is a supremely bad idea, especially for offenders of this nature. You do not want to do that. Like I said, he pled not guilty, but it took the jury about seven hours to decide otherwise, and he was ultimately sentenced to death. California rarely executes, however, even though there's hundreds of people sitting on death row. NASA's in his mid-80s now, and he's probably going to die before an execution date could be set, but still. I think I read somewhere, too, that there hasn't been an execution since 2006. In California? Yeah. That doesn't surprise me. California. It's weird that they still have the death penalty, and they, like, refuse to actually use it. It's just sort of symbolic, I guess. Maybe it's like on a transition out. Who knows? Yeah. I mean, there's, I think there, I think I read there are about 800 people sitting on death row right now. So. Oh my gosh. Yeah. (laughs) After he was convicted of those four murders, two other victims were attributed to him. Sharia Patton and Sarah Dillon, also known as Renee Shapiro, lined up with the victims in his notes. The other victims found in NASA's notes have not been identified. And given the time span between murders, I wouldn't be surprised if the number of women he killed exceeded the number of his known victims by a lot. He traveled quite a bit. He lived in and out of the U.S. He vacationed a lot, and there was a lot of opportunity for him to commit more murders and get away with it. He was a petty criminal all throughout his life. He would shoplift even into his 70s, so he just doesn't seem like the kind of person that would just stop for years and years and years at a time, but who knows? The Murder Squad podcast did a whole episode on Nasso and the search for his other victims in, I think, June of last year. So definitely go check that out and check out their website for a lot more information on how horrible this guy is and more pictures from the case and things like that. They have some images of his notes, too, about 
the way he wrote about these women. It's really disgusting to read, but we didn't put it on our website just because of how vulgar it is. But if you're interested in that, definitely go on to the Murder Squad podcast website. So the connection to the Rochester murders is pretty obvious. Four of the women that Nasso killed had double initials and the victims in Rochester had the double initials. But the links didn't stop there. Nasso had actually lived in Rochester and had family there that he visited often. So he was back and forth there quite a lot. He was a violent sex offender. He was a photographer, which could be an element in choosing and stalking his victims. There's even pictures on the Murder Squad podcast website, too, that Joseph Nasso took while he was stalking women. It's really creepy. Ultimately, Nasso could not be linked to the murders in Rochester. His DNA did not match the DNA found in Wanda's clothes, and he was not found to be a super viable suspect. He generally attacked and murdered adult women, often sex workers, and didn't really ever show an affinity for children. So it seemed that Nasso was an alphabet killer, but not the one that New York police were looking for. To me, I still don't think he could be ruled out completely as playing a role. I think it's pretty wild that he lived in the area and he would go on to murder women with double initials, even one that had the exact same name as one of the victims in Rochester. Like, if all of these things in this case are coincidences, then I just, I don't know. That the coincidences in this case just, like, are a mile high. I know. I honestly have some gut feeling that that man that was violent towards the person trying to help him who drove the beige car and looked like Michelle was in the car and he had this alibi of going job hunting. I just have a gut feeling that like he's not as innocent as he makes himself out to be. And then also it's strange how similar Kenneth Bianchi looks to the sketch of the supposed abductor. Yeah, definitely go on our website and look at the sketch compared to his picture. It's crazy how similar it is but that pretty much wraps up the suspects that were looked into on this case it's been a long time with no new information and we can only hope that the forensics lend themselves to these cases being solved one day soon if you have any information on carmen cologne's murder call the monroe county sheriff's office tip line at 585-753-4175 To share information on the murder of Wanda Walkowitz, call the New York State Police at 585-398-4100, or you can also email tips to crimetip at troopers.ny.gov. If you have tips about the murder of Michelle Manza, call the Wayne County Sheriff's Office at 315-946-5781, or email tip at co.wayne.gov. .ny.us. Lastly, like we said, definitely go check out the Murder Squad podcast episode about Joseph Nasso. They're really trying to help identify the other victims that he may have killed, and maybe you could help them identify more of those women and help bring closure to the families. Yeah, and thank you guys so much for tuning in on this episode. Go ahead and give us that five star rating and Make sure to tune in in two weeks when we have our new episode come out. We have some cool stuff in store, and we're excited to share that information with you. Also, don't forget about our new book club episode coming out on March 6th. It is going to be Where the Crawdads Sing. We're really excited about it. This is probably one of both of our favorite books that we've read. We feel a lot of connections to it, and we're really excited to talk to you guys about it. If you're interested in our book club episodes, make sure to stay tuned for that. Also, in that episode, we will be telling you the next month's book, and it's also a really good one, so go check it out. Thank you for diving into the abyss with us, and we'll catch you soon. Bye. Get on it. <laughs> I don't know. So get on it. No. <laughs> it sounds really aggressive. Is that just me? <laughs> Go and do so, it. So do it now. Else. <laughs> no. I hate when I do that. I like, want to add something. And I'm like, it's like you felt the passion, but you didn't have the words. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's in there. <laughs> Roy, Roy Hazelwood and several profiles. Roy Roy Hazelwood and several other profiles, all retired from law enforcement, were. Po- <laughs> God dang it! <laughs> Roy Hazelwood and several. I cannot say a single word in this.
Roy Hazelwood and several other profilers. Profilers. <laughs> I, can't, I can't say Roy. I can't say Hazelwood. I can't say several, and I can't say profilers. You've got and another down <laughs> pat, though. Let me tell you. The ancient. 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 ancient.